This day's been quieter because I've been working on my own. Uh, the other guys are way over there. I should really get better prepared with questions and stuff for them. I wasn't really sure what Smoko was, but um, it turned out to be a tea break. It's the time when a lot of the really interesting conversations go on. I thought it was the perfect time to ask them some questions about farming in general. I just wanted to know the history of farming and what the white settlers did when they first arrived here. They removed thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of trees. They completely cleared it. A lot of country, particularly in the hillier areas, it was ringbarked and left standing. And as soon as you'd ring bark and you'd kill the tree, below the tree, because you've had all that leaf fall and nutrient drop over the years, the grass would really uh, respond to the ring barking of the tree. So then, then that generated, I guess, uh, yeah, illusion of fertility, because the fertility is always there. It's just in the tree and in the biodiversity that that tree supports. It was seen as out of reach or not available, but we now know that biodiversity drives a whole lot of processes which are essential to ongoing sustainability and nutrient transfer within a landscape. Well, I was still clearing when I was a kid. Yeah. The, the, the clearing was still going on. There were still quite significant blocks of timber around. I was only little, but I can remember great, great long windrows all across the hill where they dozed the timber up and um, every winter they'd burn it. See, uh, after pastoralism, when they divvied the blocks up, for, for closer settlement under the Closer Settlement Act, you got you got the land really cheaply, but you were required to clear it. Everybody here and on most of the, the country, they're, they're living off what their grandfathers did. They, they have, you know, they've got the cleared blocks. They're just farming it. I asked Graham to give me a rundown of how the drought had been affecting him and, and what he thought about the drought in general. The last six or seven years have certainly been difficult and very challenging for us, dealing with the, the dry seasons. The idea of the farmer working away diligently at looking to the skies and hoping it'll rain, I guess that image, it doesn't really equate to a, a practical plan B for dealing with climate change. Rarely when we talk about drought are we talking about a complete lack of rainfall or zero rainfall over that year or growing season. And when you use the word, it's a given that it's a drought, it's not raining, there's nothing we can do until it rains. And you'll see this no clearer than in the media when you read the newspaper or, or listen to the radio or on TV. And whenever there's a story about drought, there's always a strong suggestion of complete impotence to its overwhelming force. And so what that does is it automatically sets up an assumption or a message that we can't do anything until it rains again. Maybe, you know, is there something we can do? If we can't change the rainfall, then should there be other questions being asked, perhaps about our management? If you turn your camera out there, yeah. I just wanted to come and show you this as a contrast. You know, it'd be between five and ten kilometres from Arcadia. It's the same rainfall. Well, the water's not going to soak into the ground, and you can see stock are walking around and then the dust starts blowing off it and the topsoil goes and then it's harder to establish plants and then in turn means the ground starts capping which means less rainfall soaks into it and so you get this spiral of decay and you get images like this flooding the national news when you don't get the story behind it you don't get that hey hang on well what's happening next door five k's up the road Obviously, you've got to change your system of management to adapt to the climate. And what's happened here is the system of management that was quite happily floating along perhaps in the, in the 60s and 70s when it used to rain has not changed since that time. So there's been no ad adaptation. 
as the seasons get drier and as farmers gain access to new knowledge. But it's not uncommon to see, you know, drive through an area and see, you know, you know, 20k trip, three or four properties that look like that. Yeah. On our way back to the to Graham's place, we got caught up in a dust storm, which I've never seen before, and is amazed to find out that it was made a lot worse by the overgrazing. Of course, that would make sense. So that dust comes from the overgrazed paddocks. Yep. Of course, it was a strange irony that I came here on the subject of drought and whilst I was here, it looked like we were going to get some rain. And there's a huge, huge clouds building up in the corner of the sky and uh, we, we knew something was coming and it was big. What you wanted, but as long as it keeps going, right? Oh, even even oh, that. You know, settle the dust, cool the air down. You know, if, even if you don't get a lot enough rain to have an effect on the plants, just the coolness and the moisture in the air takes the stress off the plants, so that you got that longer time. Yeah. No, oh, no, no. Here, everybody's going. Yay! Oh, yay! Yeah, beautiful. Three blocks down, you got. Ah, uh, it's all come at the wrong time. All it'll ever do is dry weeds. Oh. <laughs> it'll ruin the dry feed. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, shit, I should have got crop insurance. <laughs> Gee, I can just hear it now. I'm going to start cutting hay next week. That's fuck that idea. It'll we'll just make the rust go nuts. <laughs> <laughs> great to see how excited they were about the rain and it carried on for the rest of the day actually and into the early evening and uh, on into the night. <laughs> 